Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. Do you want to do another chit-chat? Yeah, I like chit-chatting with you. Yeah, I like chit-chatting with you, too. And welcome to another special episode of Pandas Talking Games. I'm your host who likes to chit, Phil. <laughs> and I'm your host who likes to chat, Senda. And just to, to lay this out firstly and quickly, we're not going to be editing this episode again so I'm about to lay an outtake on you right now, and it's not going to end up after the show. He told me not five minutes ago that there would be no extra business in the introductions this time. <laughs> you know, so people know that we script the show, but what people don't know is that that is actually a part of the show we do not script. Never so scripted. So the ever. intro part, the hey, send a hey, Phil, do you want to talk about whatever, that's scripted. Yeah. But the... Um, the welcome part is usually an on-the-fly thing that I make up, sometimes successfully, <laughs> sometimes not, if you listen Less to the outtakes. successfully, outtake. yes. <laughs> but it is, it is ad-libbed. The other part of, um, in Misdirected Mark, do you know one of the parts of the show that's um, always ad-libbed? Which, which part? It's the closing. Yeah. It's the line before... Um, about leaving feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I knew that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That line, whatever the show topic is, I make it up cold on the fly. Like, you know. You used to say interesting things about the Google Plus community. That yeah, but not that part. Like, that part's places. scripted, right? No, the, no, but you, you, you would say if you want to join our, you know, whatever, and then it would be something related to the topic. Yeah. Then I always think of it in conjunction with the Google Plus community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we should tell these good people. Well, let's tell them what, what we're doing. Let's. Yeah, exactly. Let, yeah, let's tell them first. This is another chit chat episode. So if you're joining us and didn't listen last week or um, don't remember, um, we well, you are... haven't listened to this ep- to this podcast before. In which case, yeah, please be. Th- this isn't a normal episode. It's not a bad episode. It's gonna. No. We're still gonna be talking about gaming stuff, and we're gonna be talking a little bit about life stuff. But um, in the um, in the current global pandemic, and the fact that we are both in states that are still in lockdown, um, to make life a little easier on ourselves, um, we have relieved ourselves of a few duties regarding the podcast. So, um, I have. Um, I have relieved myself from the responsibility of having to script the show, yep. like get a topic, write it up, give us, you know, talking points and all of that. Oh, you wanted me to say my part. OK, cool. Um, I- I'm not editing. So this show will be edited to the extent that it will have the intro and it will have music and it will have music at the end. But I'm not editing anything else. <laughs> right now, if you are new to the show. That is not how we normally do things. Normally on the no. show, um, we have a topic. We discuss it from two points of view, often from the point of view of one shots and campaigns. Um, yeah, but not and, exclusively. Uh, and we edit um, the show and put all the outtakes at the end of the show or into a little bonus outtake for our patrons um, so that in general, the show is uh, pretty smooth sounding. Yeah. I also edit out a lot of ums. So yeah. many. And <laughs> that takes work, right? So yeah. on average, right, it takes you a, a couple hours a week to uh, turn over that audio. Three to four. Three it to depends four. on how far over we go. Correct. So yeah. three to four hours to package everything and post it to the site. It takes me um, about a solid hour of writing but a, about four days of pondering the topic to get it ready. So I pick the topic on a Monday. I don't sit and write the script for the show until Friday, but I spend the rest of the week thinking about the topic and kind of formulating arguments and points and you know doing a little bit of research and stuff like that. So it's kind of hard for me to pin my... Definitions. Um, like my exact I- times down. Yeah. Um, the one I do know is like I on Friday night, I sit down with a template and start banging out the show notes. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. That said, this again will be a chit chat. So what we've adopted as our informal format for the show is that we're each going to talk about a thing in gaming that's giving us life. Mm-hmm. And um, then we're each going to talk about another thing in life that uh, another thing that's giving us life. Although last week we did things in the kitchen that were giving us life. And yep. as it turns out, um, the it's, kitchen has yeah. uh, reigned supreme once again. And yeah. we're going to do another things in the kitchen that are giving us life. But if we do more of these chit chats, and I think we will probably for a little while. Yeah. We may vary what that um, second thing that's giving us life. Yeah. Fair? It just happens to be that the kitchen is very life-giving oh. because tasty food is tasty. And one more thing. Um, yes. I just want to credit giving giving me life is a um, definitely a term I learned from the Gauntlet podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jason Cordova and the rest of the cast of the Gauntlet um, – we can by no means take any credit for the phrase giving me life. And we um, hopefully we are borrowing it without them minding um, because they are wonderful people and a wonderful podcast as well. So just credit where credit is due. It's all over the place nowadays. Yeah, but I, I learned it from that was uh, where. Yeah, I, I learned, learned it from, from watching you. So <laughs> yes. okay. or maybe Twitter. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Fair but. enough. Uh, let's get started with things in gaming that are giving us life this week. Send mm-hmm. Cool. Well, um, so I've been really excited because I've... So, for Gnome Stew, um, for the last... There was a little chunk of time in there. I was doing a ton of research and basically compiling a lot of games um, that were intended to be played remotely. Um, and when I say intended to re- be played remotely, I mean actually written to be played remotely, whether that mean, means that they're like letter writing games or if they're games that are specifically written to be played on Discord or via like Zoom chat, like that kind of game. And I've basically been um, compiling lists of those. And I even have a couple more, but like they're getting harder to find because <laughs> um, before <laughs> this happened, there weren't like a ton of easy hashtags or anything to find them by. And most of them are on itch where the search functionality is sometimes difficult um so so i've been compiling those lists and the fun thing that i then get to do having compiled those lists is go play said games um which is super cool so i've now gotten to play um a couple more of them than i had when i had uh actually released those articles on gnome stew um and the thing that's giving me life about it is it's just really cool to play a game in which at no time are you going Okay, but how do I account for this thing that I would have done at the table? That instead, you are taking advantage of the fact that you're not at a table, right? So the first one that I played, um, actually, it wasn't the first one that I played, but of the two that I played most recently, the first one was, um, are you there, God? It's the quarterly earnings report. And that one is fun because it uses the tools of the video chat, as your angelic powers, which is fun and neat and just um, like gives you that it, it's you still just interacting with your computer, right, to, to use your powers. But like you do things like mute or you're not muted when you think, quote, think you're muted or like you can hang up and rejoin like that kind of stuff, which is fun. So those are your powers. So that's cool because it it it, it gives you like all the tools of the game are part of the format in which you play the game, which is at a distance, which is handy right now, right? Because we're all at a distance. But the last one that I played um, was last Thursday, and we played uh, We Robot, which is um, a very loose, freeform game about playing a bunch of different facets of an AI who are trying to figure out what the purpose of their AI is, right? Like, they're trying to figure out... Um, what they are, like, what are they being built to do? And in the background, you have um, a programmer who is um, dropping little packets of randomized content to um, individual facets, kind of every 10 to 20 minutes. It's like whenever something slows down and you want to inject new, you know, conversational bits into the game. And what's cool about this game, there's two things. The, The first one is like, you can pass notes at a table, but like everybody knows you passed a note, right? Like they all see it. <laughs> They're like, you passed a note. What's going on over there? Um, so when you are sending someone an email or if you're sending them a, a DM, 
or something like that, a private message. Um, no one else knows that they received it. Like, unless they say it or something, in this game it wouldn't make sense to say it because you're facets of an AI trying to learn its environment. Um, you receive a packet of information and then you register that and use it to reinterpret the world around you. Um, but the other facets don't receive that same packet of information and they don't even know that you actually have. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. And that's the first part of that game that I, I feel like takes advantage of the fact that you're remote. The second part is that it's completely based on the objects that are in your vicinity. So everything that you learn as an AI about interacting with the world is based on the stuff that you're sitting with at your desk or wherever you're playing the game, right? And so you get a whole variety of different things based on where people actually are in their house um, or like what room they're in or like where they chose to sit down, like all kinds of stuff like that. It was really interesting because I was sitting at my desk, so I have a bunch of like office-y stuff, right? But uh, one of the gentlemen in my gaming group was sitting in his garage and he was like wandering around with an axe and at one point a jackhammer and that was a thing and we all kind of paused for a moment to be like hey, hang on time out time out did you just walk by with a jackhammer <laughs> like because like what um but like so so that was very cool because that literally takes advantage of the fact that we're not in the same place because we don't have the same stuff in front of us to interact with to interpret um so that was super cool and and uh, so i'm enjoying doing that sort of game where i don't feel like i'm missing anything by going online or having to adjust when i feel like i am actually just getting to play a game the way that it was built to be played and uh and it just kind of experience the original intent Right. I guess that's the best way for me to say it. The original intent of these games was to be played online. And so I'm getting to experience it the way it was intended to be experienced instead of in a way that I'm adjusting to experience it. So it's interesting because I'm running a lot of games online right now. Yeah. But you're uh, and, adjusting. <laughs> and most of them I transitioned from physical tabletop to virtual tabletop. Yeah. And for sure, there is... Um, for sure, there is a learning curve that my group and I are going through as we are playing the game, which is definitely creating a drag, um, not a drag in enjoyment, because I think we're enjoying the game. We're enjoying the games that we're running tremendously. But in terms of making things slower, the virtual tabletop, the adjustment to virtual tabletop, um, because again, like you said, we're translating a media that. Um, was built for being on um, it was built for being on the regular uh, desktop and um, now it's being translated virtually um, and having to deal with that. So what's interesting is things like uh, messing with the map. Yeah. Uh, because I'm not very proficient at roll 20, but luckily for me, uh, Chris is. So yeah. <laughs> Chris has been a big help with helping me kind of get the map together. Yeah. Um, but then there's things like people are having trouble uh, typing the command in for rolling. Yep. Yeah. Dice. So like somebody forgets to like puts the wrong slash in. Yep. Now it doesn't roll their die roll. So then like somebody else is like, no, 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 no. Forward like slash this. R, right? That yep. kind of thing. So. Yep. There's a little extra, I, I say drag as in terms of like uh, boating, right? There's like a little extra drag in the speed of the story. The game is still uh, completely enjoyable and we're all having fun playing, but there is that hurdle. And so it's very interesting that uh, as designers, uh, as designers, we typically design role-playing games to be played in, uh, in tabletop medium. We don't always think about how to play them in a virtual medium, though I know, I know because we're writing <laughs> because it. We've, we've done it. <laughs> right. That uh, Turning Point actually has a chapter yeah, uh, about that has a that chapter morning. for virtual play that talks about uh, how to play the game virtually because it is uh, a bit of a, uh, 
it's actually a game that suits playing online really well. Yeah, and well. it just There's needs it needs a, a few couple of tweaks. Yeah. It needs a few tweaks because of um things like heartstrings. Yeah, physical um, components. But we have run it online. Oh, absolutely. And it, and it's been very successful with with the few modifications. And now that I'm like looking at roll 20, I'm even looking at like hmm <laughs> you can are write, there, a, write like, a thing there because there's a well, like are you there can tokens? buy like like well yeah I mean, but you can buy you can create stuff and then people can buy it like you can buy for the queen the digital version on roll 20 yeah i just got right, my uh it. i just got my copy of uh fiasco for roll 20 oh yeah right well because because it's cool and, like then you just have all of the stuff online already yes um i mean the, the only thing for us is really just like there's a, there's a token pool right and so like you have to have a way to draw from it and to count everything up and to you know all of that kind of stuff that's the that's the piece where with a little bit of roll 20 help yeah that would be the one piece. Everything else about that it is pretty be. straightforward. The character yeah. sheet, the um, first player sheet, all of that stuff would actually be really easy to integrate in the game. I, I don't yeah. want to. I don't want to wander too far off. But no, I yeah. guess the interesting part is, as designers, yeah, this is an opportunity for us. I, 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 I think, think I think we're past opportunity, right? Like now that we've we like <laughs> post pandemic, yeah, post pandemic. I think as designers, like we really need to start considering. How does my game play online? Because we're going through a period where months have gone by where we are all just playing online and we do want our games to be playable. Yeah. So I I do think that that's actually a thing um, that we do need to look at. And I think it's really neat that you've played games optimized for online play and are, are seeing the advantages of it. Seeing the right. advantages, uh, like how designers are taking advantage of that particular medium, right? To uh, to make a enjoyable role playing experience, but one that's actually unique, and in fact, would even be difficult to translate and play you, you on the couldn't. tabletop, right? Right, like, like I, it would actually be really hard to play either of those games in person. And the next one that I w- would like to play, I don't know if my group's on board yet. I haven't actually asked them yet. So, you know, we'll see. Um, the next one that I would like to play is called There Are Ghosts in This Discord. And what you do is you you set up a Discord server and you give it a bunch of rooms in like a haunted house. And then the people who play the ghosts can only type. And so they go to a room and they haunt it. Um, oh, and then if you're an investigator... You can read the type, but you can't interact via text. You can only talk to each other on your quote walkie talkie, which is the voice chat, right? So oh, nobody can actually like so you you don't you don't interact, like you don't interface directly text to text or, or audio to audio, but you have like these two separate groups who are playing the game together in different mediums, which is really cool. So anyway. I really want to try that one. <laughs> no, I think that's really fascinating. Right, right? again, just like this is again like the stuff that is like you can't you can't actually necessarily do this in person, right. right? So I am taking advantage of certain things in the virtual tabletop that I couldn't do normally, right? So right. I'm able to uh, I I don't have to draw my maps yeah, that on my nice. dry erase board. <laughs> Uh, I am a terrible artist. I am left-handed, and dry erase boards and left-handers are a challenge to begin with. So it's really nice uh, to be able to load the map into Roll20, uh, place the Fog of War the over fog it, of war. and then uh, reveal sections of it as we play. Uh, I like that a bunch. But then there's things I won't do. Like, the players are like, oh, are you going to put tokens out for the monsters? And I'm like, no. No. Like... <laughs> No, we're still playing theater of the mind. I gave you guys tokens just so that you can like put yourself like in the room or like if you split up or something, we can keep track of that. But like, no, 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 no. I'm not like making um, and I'm not um, I'm not saying anyone who does this is doing it wrong because I did it back in the day when I was running Iron Heroes. I'm not in a place where I want to make. Um, all of those tokens and then put them out and move them around or whatever. I, I, I specifically play games um, that avoid that. Like I've yeah. played all the games that did that for a long time. And uh, I, I mean, I have 
a box of cardboard um, cutout tokens behind me that I used to use for Iron Heroes. So I have done all that. I just don't do it anymore. And I, I just, you know, I'm in some ways underutilizing the virtual tabletop because it has all those features, but I'm just like, nah, I don't need those. It takes a lot of prep to use those features, either a lot of prep or a lot of like know-how to use those features without adding a lot of latency to the game where you have to basically just jump out and mess with the software Mm -hmm. Um, in the same, I mean, which is not necessarily any different than like if I'm a GM and I have a whole bin of miniatures next to me, I can either have spent the time beforehand to sort out all the miniatures and have them available knowing that that encounter is going to come or the encounter comes and then I have to dig through and find some, right? right? Like it's kind of the same thing, but it's different. And so like you, you know, depending on how well you know the software um, or like just the interface itself, you know, like it's either longer or slower process to get all that stuff out on the board i was so nerdy um, that i had this um i had this big plastic box where i had all the tokens separated into little you know into little compartments and i had a small one that i used to um, when i would prep my games i would stock it from the main one <laughs> so that each encounter was in its own little square and i could just take right. out the tokens from that encounter and put them on just the table boink yep. okay cool um well, are you good with yours yeah, um, I can tell you a thing about Roll20 and setting up maps so that you can have separate maps and then you can jump them to the different oh, maps with the stuff I, 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 I know all that really stuff wanna... now. No, no, okay, good. I know all that stuff now. <laughs> but it's that part I can idea. do. Okay, good. Yeah, no, tell me about uh, what's giving you life in gaming. So I, I'm kicking around this, uh, I was kicking around this thought over the last week or so, and it may wind up being a future Gnome Stew article. I'm not beholden to it, but... I was uh, I was running my Forbidden Lands game this week, and like I'm 21 sessions into this Forbidden Lands game, yep. And um, we had this pivotal fight uh, where the characters got rid of the demon that lives under their their uh, keep that they've recovered. Right, they recovered this ruined keep, and they finally like released the demon that was magically sealed in the vault and um, nearly died, mm-hmm. recovered, and then mm-hmm. defeated it. So at the end of the session, I told them, I was like, because for me, this kind of ends, I shouldn't say for me, for the game, it ends the like first major arc of the game. Right. And we're about to kick off the next arc, which is actually some of the published material from Free League, uh, the Raven's Purge is the uh, name of the uh, campaign material. Yeah. So I said to them when we finished up, I was like, okay, I'm like, this is the conclusion to book one of the series, right? Like this series has reached the end of book one and it got me thinking because, um, it got me thinking, sorry. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I woke Siri wow. up. <laughs> you can really phone. <laughs> sorry. It, it got me thinking because the week before that I was doing character generation for my uh, icons game. And we were talking about, like, how did the characters come to be? Because I was trying to get a feel for everybody's character concept. And I started just kind of instinctively, as we were talking, referring to things in issues and pages. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, I'm picturing your character, like, on the last page of the issue before the Cosmic Invasion event, doing like, you know, on the rooftop with so-and-so, like battling it out. And then like we see the, you know, we see the Kel Cruiser appear over the city, right? And then like that's before the big event starts. So cool. Right. And and that idea of 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 defining the game in terms of the media that inspires it. The same thing with Forbidden Lands, right? Defining it in terms of like a, a, a fantasy um, novel, you know, like a, a series of fantasy novels. And the other game I've been, you know, I've been reading on the side has been Star Trek Adventures and I've been binging uh, DS9 while I've been doing it. So episode is also another uh, thing. Star Trek Adventures uses uh, mission. Right. But that's but I'm really like, an episode. But I'm like episode. Isn't it? Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's episode. Because one of the things I was thinking about is I was, and I'll try to connect all these dots in a second. I was, as I was reading, as I was watching Star Trek and I was thinking about a future campaign, I was like, oh, you know, based on the tropes of Star Trek, I need an episode that is a time travel episode. I need a holodeck. Uh, I need a holodeck accident. I need Mm. a transporter accident episode. 
I need a, um, I, did I say time travel? Then I need a mirror universe episode, right? Yeah. Uh, and then I've been picking that apart even further because I'm like, oh, this is this kind of episode. This is that kind of episode. Because Star Trek has some established tropes. Really? Just a couple? Well, yes. <laughs> it's okay. Remember, tropes make us feel comfortable. I know. Um, it's good. Tropes are like french fries, man. I, like, I was just teasing you. <laughs> yes. I was just teasing you. So, to kind of unify what I'm thinking about, and which is why I'm thinking this may go out to an article on Gnomes too, I think that it is helpful at times to think of your campaign in the media that it might emulate. Now, I have said before um, on Misdirected Mark with Chris and I have talked about this before that an RPG is not the same as a book or a movie or anything else. It is very much its own media type, right? It, It behaves differently than any of the other types. But I also don't think it hurts to sometimes borrow their structures when referencing it. And so I think there's just this neat concept of how do you think about your, how do you think about the units of story in your game, right? Are you thinking of your game as a movie series? Are you thinking of it as a, uh, TV series. A long time ago, Chris once said to me that he likes to run his games like BBC television series, like seven, eight episodes, and that's done for a season. And maybe he comes back a future season. Maybe he doesn't, right? But he has right. the option to pick it up again. So I just, I think that that's the question I pose to people. And it's the thing that I've been um, kind of kicking around in my head is what, how do you think about those units of story in your game. What are they? And does that bear any influence on how you run the game? Like if I call something an issue, then does that help me does that help me reinforce the idea that we're playing a comic book game? And if I call it an episode, is that more dramatic? In a book, in a series, right? Is that more epic? Right. So that's the thing I'm kicking around in my head right now. And I don't have a, a definitive answer for it. I feel like that's what it's helping with. Uh, but I, I like need to kind of do a little more introspection. Well, it's interesting because you're what you're making me think about is when I run games, I frequently default to, um, even as a GM, just literally describing things as a camera, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that that's sort of my default mode. But if you switch that to define things um, and, and this is just a more granular version of what you're talking about like if as you're setting an individual scene so I will frequently say you know the the camera you know pans in past you know the 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 giant trees and and, and crows fly out of them as the sun sets or something right um, but if instead of describing it like that you said you know we see a panel of a quiet forest with the sunset in the background and then in the next panel the same forest but there are crows flying away right like you've actually you've described the same moment but you've described it in like the words of either a comic or like some sort of film genre media I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I think that that will have an effect on how you play the game because all the other thing is that as a GM, like your descriptions um, influence your players' descriptions, right? So like using the terminology from those things, whether it's, you know, a page, an issue, a panel, or if it's like um, when we say fade to black, even like that's a movie thing. That's a, 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 a series thing. Um, like, I'll even do stuff when I'm running, like, a Magical Girls game. I'll be like, cool, fade to black. We're going to have a commercial break, right? Like, you know, it, I think that it does do that kind of thing for you. And I think that it's just, um, I think it's I think it's genre emulating. I think it, it's genre enforcing. Yeah, that's 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 been my current feel on it as well, right? I think that yeah. how we think of how we think of the units of story in a game can help um, can help convey the genre just as much as uh, tropes and other things inside a game. Yeah, 
I will say without getting too without falling down this rabbit hole further because I want to switch on to our other topic. Yeah, food. But there's another <laughs> thing that I um, there's another conscious decision I make in every game that I run. Yeah. Which is what do I call the group of characters? Yeah. So in um, in some games I refer to them as rogues. Some yep. games I refer to them as heroes. Yep. Right. So I think that what you call that group it, and I and and I don't call it to them like to their like in game. It's right. how I reference them in my prep. Yeah. So I will spend like I will spend time actually thinking about like interesting. Uh, right. So like in my um, what do, what forbidden do you, lands game, they yeah. are adventurers. Yeah, I was like, what what do you call what do you call them when you're planning for hydro hackers? Now I want to know. Uh, in hydro hackers, they're the crew. The crew, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, they're a crew, right? Yeah. Um, and in uh, masks, obviously heroes. Yep. Um, in uh, in uh, tales from the loop, kids. Yep. Right. Yeah. That's pretty. So obvious. I mean, I think what we're really exploring is that the language that you use is genre enforcing, and you can use it intentionally to, you know, reinforce genre, or you could not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think you're right, right? I mean, just the way we talk about the game. Yeah. Right? It, it, it we can enforce how we how we visualize it even. We can enforce genre not only in game, but we can ref, we can enforce genre uh outside of the game by how we talk about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Thanks cool. for helping there you crystallize go. that. I may uh yeah, go that write may that article. just become a uh, article. <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, then let's switch topics. Um, uh-huh. In the shorter part of um, our show, let's talk about uh, things that are giving us life in the kitchen. Da-da-da-da. Do you want me to go first, or do yeah, you want yeah, to go you first? Go first. No, okay, no. I, I just first. talked a bunch. You talk. Oh, okay. Cool. So um, I was totally out of ideas, and I was like, oh, I'm not going to have anything fun about the kitchen. That's probably not a topic that's going to work really well for me this week. And then I was like, you know, I have all these bookmarks. Um, in this Bon Appetit because I get them monthly because it's a thing that my father gifts me with um, for my birthday every year as a subscription to Bon Appetit, which is fun because just side note, um, they're actually pretty good at tossing in recipes that you can actually do on a weeknight um, for meals and stuff. And so I really enjoy it. Anyway, so I was flipping through this last one um, from April and there was... Um, a whole bunch of onion stuff in there. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. But I was flipping through and there was a triple threat onion galette. And it's a, a savory galette, which is like a pie with an extra super buttery crust. And I was like, hmm, 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 I could do that. Um, I have all of that stuff. I have green onions growing in my backyard. Bring it, right? So You had, um, that, mu- you had that much butter? I did. Butter has not been an issue for me to get mostly. I've been keeping No, I'm just joking because it has a lot of butter. So much butter. Um, yeah, so the crust has one and a half sticks of butter in it. And then the caramelized onions took the other four <laughs> tablespoons. <laughs> so it has two, com- two full sticks of butter between the crust and the contents. And then a cup of Parmesan cheese, grated Parmesan cheese. Mm on the inside and it's got this really it's oh, it's really good it's very rich because of all the butter um we learned that we cut the pieces too big the first time because we ate them we were like that was so good and then we were like oh bleh. like oh, i'm dying um so but it was very very delicious it has a very cool um kind of i think it's kind of a new mommy flavor because you you take the you have the this wonderful really flaky crust and then you you put um, a thin layer of Dijon mustard on it, and then you put the caramelized onions down, um, and it's caramelized onions and garlic, and then you um, and then you fold up the the edges because a galette is like a, a hand build. You don't do it in a pie dish, right? You you fold up the edges over it, and um, and then you take uh, a bunch of green onions that have been just tossed in the butter that was used to. Um, caramelize the other onions you just take those and you plop them on the top and then you bake it and the the green onions get all kind of like nice and crispy and green and then like the mustard settles in with the caramelized onion literally my mouth is watering describing this and i had it for breakfast i'm I'm dying just i'm dying listening to the description of this it's so good it is not an easy weeknight meal because 
you have to make the crust by hand and you do have to make it like you you couldn't just use a pie crust that you bought right. at the store it would not work so you have to make this crust because it has so much butter in it so you have to make the crust and then it bakes for like 45 minutes and that's after you've caramelized the onions so like it's kind of a process it's not like a oh did, i just need to turn something out but it's like did oh. your whole house just smell of like caramelized onions onions yes. garlic butter yes. like <laughs> yeah. oh goodness it was really good and the the parmesan cheese oh i forgot to you you put the caramelized onions and you put the parmesan cheese on top then you fold yeah, in yeah. the stuff then you put the green onions on top but like the the parmesan cheese because it's such a hard cheese the like the way that it like crisps over the top in between the layers of onion it just it's very good I am very it, impressed, Bon Appetit, that I could do that with, A, I did that with all ingredients that were in my house, which is great because I'm not going out for extra grocery shopping trips right now. Correct. So nothing weird, right? I mean, admittedly, I have green onions growing in my garden, so I didn't have to like go out and make sure that I had like 12 green onions just sitting in the fridge or whatever, but there, there's nothing weird or obscure or anything that i like used whatever dijon mustard was in my fridge which is like you know kroger's brand like in a sure. squeezy bottle sure. right like we're not talking about anything fancy but it is oh, i had to i had to crack into a bottle of wine to have with it because it like required oh it required a crisp white yeah I'm gonna re- I'm I'm gonna require having I'm gonna require trying this the next time I'm out. Um, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can do that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Tell me. Uh, tell me. You also had an onion experience. I did, and mine was also from Bon Appetit. That's also um, <laughs> they were doing like an onion thing for April. I, I think so. Yeah. They so. Were. Uh, I, so I so I saw this. Uh, I saw this recipe for. They called it onion bacon. Uh, egg sandwich and it was like their take on kind of like a fancy bodega like uh, egg sandwich to eat so I looked at it really quick and I was like okay one this looks really easy to make like this is the kind of thing after sleeping in on a Sunday morning I could get up and make like as a brunch and not spend all morning in the kitchen because I was like I wanted something cool for breakfast. Like every, everything about this kind of piqued my interest. So you start with um, start with an onion, cut it in half, break it, break it into big rings. Yep. Then toss them with um, a little bit of soy sauce, olive oil, and garlic powder. Okay. Toss them through, throw them on a baking sheet, chuck them in the oven. Uh, 35, I think I went about 30, depending on the onion, but about 30, 35 minutes. Soften them like just, you know. Yes. flip them once along the way and like let them really soften down then made a spread um i chopped up some um basil cilantro fresh fresh basil fresh cilantro fresh parsley mix that in with um green hot sauce and a little bit of olive oil whipped that up mm-hmm. into a like whipped that up into like a nice herby hot um spread Got myself um, the big sandwich size English muffins because I'm a big dude. Mm-hmm. You could do it with regular English muffins, but I got big yeah, dude I w- English muffins. I would I would probably not be able to finish. <laughs> sure, uh, I, I ate two of these. So it, so anyway, <laughs> well, it was brunch. Um, it was brunch, and it was like one of the two meals I was going to eat for the day. So all right, so I toasted those uh, toasted those up. Took the um, herby spread, put it on the bottom. Uh, whipped up eggs the way I like eggs. You can whip. You could just make eggs any way you like. The original recipe was like a, a soft scrambled. I got like a texture thing with soft eggs to begin with, so I made mine um, a little more omelette and then like cut it into squares. Mm-hmm. Um, but you could, you know, you could easily soft fry, poach, doesn't matter. Tossed on the egg, topped it with a little cheese, threw that bottom piece into the oven while the onions were finishing up pulled everything out, then took the onions, placed it on top of the cheese and egg, put the top on it with the last of the sauce on the top. And, oh, it was, it was so good, right? Like, I mean, first of all, the, the onion, right? Like that, that, um, soft and they were big onions, right? Cause you like, you just break the rings, you don't chop it up, you don't slice it up. So 
just um, big, chewy, um, you know, really savory onions. Very umami, right? Like yeah, garlic, soy, onions. But really, the um, the herby hot sauce is like what Killed stole it. the show for yeah. me. Like because you're you've got the really savory onions, and then you've got your eggs and your cheese, right? That's delicious. And then just as you bite through. You've got this just really um, vibrant herb flavor because of just the freshly chopped herbs with on the back end of it, the green hot sauce. Like kick. Yeah. Yeah. Like it just it comes on subtle. It doesn't come on strong. It comes on just after the herby part. And oh, it was killer. It was killer. And it took me maybe 45 minutes to make from start to finish. Like I got a lot of economy of scale out. Like I got, I was able to overlap things because it wasn't so hectic where um, I had to prep everything individually. Like I was able to get the onions in the oven, chop up all the greens to make the sauce, then you know, whip up some eggs towards the end of the onions. You know, to- toast everything and throw it together at the last minute. Um, it was fantastic. <laughs> it was it was delicious, and um, you know, it was just the kind of thing where. I um I wanted to just like like have like a little treat for brunch yeah. like on the weekend right like I have same breakfast almost every day yeah and I was like it's the weekend I would like something a little different from same breakfast yeah so, you know what I did this morning for breakfast I you know, I know what you did yeah I took an eighth of my onion galette and I put an egg on top of I, it it may be damn. <laughs> <laughs> Much like the tater tot waffle, right? There are there are perfect Ooh. substrates on which an egg should rest. This may that be one, is of, one the, of them. Yes. Yeah. So that sounds also um, amazing. Yeah. Um, but when we um, sit here and um, contemplate brunch so late at night <laughs> that we're getting closer to breakfast than brunch, it must be time for us to end the show. And in order to end the show, uh, we must tell everyone about another show on the Misdirected Mark Network. What show are you going to tell us about? Uh, Well, tonight I'm going to tell you about The Lounge. On The Lounge, Doc finds the best, the brightest, the most fun game designers and sits down to have a cool chat with them. You never know what conversation is going to come up in The Lounge. Awesome. Uh, Say, Senda, Mm -hmm. um, how do people find us on the internet? Well, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games. You can find us on Facebook. No. Don't find us on Facebook. I usually cut this part out, but I always said it like I said it like this for like three years, you guys. Yeah, we don't do Facebook. No, we don't do Facebook anymore. So, um, I mean, that's fine. Uh, so you can find us on Twitter. Uh, you can find us in the Misdirected Mark forums. That's a good place to find us. Or you can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com. And Phil, once they find us in one of those places, what can they do with that information? So yeah, while we're doing the chit chat episodes, we're just kind of talking about things in our lives. But when we return to our normal programming, we like to do shows about things that interest you. So please send us topics because uh, we want to discuss the things that you find interesting. Uh, it's way more um, it's way more interesting than us talking about ditch lily trivia. And uh, <laughs> I'm designing and, a shirt. And des- <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> So we, in any case, uh, send us topics. Um, don't worry about um, what. Don't worry about trying to get the topic to line up with the show. I, at this point, after four years, I'm really good at making a show out of almost all the topics. Uh, so do that. Send us topics. Uh, we pretty much run the show on all of your topics, except for when we start to chit chat, which is why we're not using episode numbers right now. Yeah, these don't actually count. Yeah, these are Excited just us. Don't count. <laughs> these are us being uh, out there with all of you, but not um, the rigors that we normally assign to um, our show. Yes. Okay. Um, in addition, if you like what we do here elsewhere on the Mr. Dr. Mark Network, please, um, if you can, um, consider supporting our Patreon campaign. The Patreon campaign goes towards supporting uh, the entire operations of the network. So that's uh, bandwidth hosting, um, equipment, all that stuff. Um, it's your generosity that makes all of this possible. Uh, we like to pay it back um, or forward or whatever to um, to our patrons. So uh, patrons of the show get access to the amazing Slack Room for Life. That's a beyond life-giving place for me um, in this time of lockdown. Um, that also includes our um, our weekly luncheon. 
oh, that yeah. we do on Zoom. On Friday, right? we have a we 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 lunch in with our patrons and mm-hmm. members of the Slack community. Mm-hmm. Um, it includes bonus outtakes from this show when there are bonus outtakes. The after show from Mr. Dr. Mark, mm-hmm. um, various assorted goodies um, as we put them together from Encoded Designs. Which again, during um, during these uh, hard times, that we're not doing a lot of that right now. But that's going to come back around eventually. Yep. Um, and when it does, our patrons will definitely reap uh, the benefits of those things. <sighs> so please, if you uh, are able to, uh, we would uh, we would appreciate it greatly if you supported the show. And in addition, we do like to shout out to some of our patrons. Normally, we pick three at random, but tonight we're just going to shout out to all of you because we feel like everybody needs a little love yeah. Uh, during these times. So thank you uh, so very much. Um, Y'all are great. Yes. Big heart. We hearts. appreciate you. <laughs> we appreciate you greatly. Thank you. Send up. Mm-hmm. Um, even though this is a chit chat episode, we must continue on with our uh, relentless marketing campaign of if you hear us, you will Rel- love us. Relentless? <laughs> relentless. Um, campaign of if you hear us you will love us um, and in order to get more people to hear us what is the thing that people who are already listening to us can do to help other people find us well you can leave us a rating or review on apple podcast or the podcatcher of your choice and every new review we get really does actually help new people find the show So thank you super, super much to everyone who's already left a review. There's even places that you can, like, leave reviews on, like, individual episodes. But, like, maybe don't rate us unless you, like, like that episode or something. Anyway, um, try saying a new review five times fast and uh, leave us one. Thank you. (laughs) Say, Senda. Um... What interesting recipe has your eye this coming week? Mm, I haven't looked through the new Bon Appetit yet. This show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Show me what you got, eh? Show me what you got. Show me what you got, eh? Show me what you got. Show me what you got, eh? Show me what you got. Show me what you got, eh? Show me what you got, eh? Uh oh, uh oh. Oh no. Okay. Weird. Weird delay. Like, I clicked and then nothing happened and then it started going waveforms. Okay. All right. Well, good as enough. As long as you got waveforms, I got waveforms. Shape. I gotta, I gotta adjust this mic a little bit. I got waveforms. It, it, okay. it, I thought it was a, a a misclick fire kind of thing, mm-hmm. but it was not. Okay. okay. All right. Ready? Jump right in. Yep. Bloop. Cue music. I don't know what that is. <laughs>